So I'm going to take this in a whole other direction, um, a personal direction. And I must confess that when I was uh, given this phrase, the other side of reason, I actually had didn't know what to think of it. I, I wasn't familiar with it. Um, it sort of had to be explained to me. And the moment I understood it in the way that I at least wanted to understand it, I'm understanding it as being unreasonable, something that doesn't make sense, something that confounds one. The first thing I thought about was parenting. Um, certainly that's true of my own parenting. I know that my sons think that I am utterly unreasonable all the time. I want them to read, not be on video games. I want them to be neat and quiet. I don't want them to talk about sports all the time. Um, just the other day, my college date son, who was driving us back from an outing, I got upset at his driving, which clearly was not good driving. Um, and he blew up at me and said, you are so unreasonable. So to me, the other side of reason is the very essence of parenting, of families. You have two generations forced to live with each other, spanning different eras, different sensibilities, incomprehensible to one another. So this is all the more so when you have a parent who comes from another country, another culture, another context, which was true of my father. So the story I'm going to tell is one that happened to me as a young adult. Um, and it's a story that was actually the seed in my most recent novel called The Long Ride. And The Long Ride takes place in the 1970s and it's about three mixed race girls who are navigating the turbulence, the racial turbulence of the 1970s, which quite honestly is not that different um, from what we're going through right now. And I was really sort of interested in mining that in-betweenness. Um, but what I'm gonna tell now is sort of the true story that's behind the plot story. Um, now, by way of background, um, my father was an immigrant from a tiny little colonial country, British Guyana in the West Indies or the Caribbean. He came to the US as a student, a college student, since he'd received a scholarship to Howard University in Washington, DC. The journey here was something of a shock. He thought he was coming to a land of freedom, and instead he found himself in a land of deep segregation. Um, because after all, at that time, Washington DC was a Jim Crow city. He eventually met my mom, um, a Jewish American woman, and um, her parents were not particularly happy with the marriage. Indeed, my grandfather never accepted it and in a way disowned her. Um, ultimately, he became a math teacher in St. Albans, Queens, which is a traditionally middle-class African-American community. So one night when I was little, we were living in Hollis, Queens at the time, we received a little knock at the door and it was the police. And the police, my mother opened the door and the police said to my mother, are you aware that there was a black man on your lawn? She looked at them. She said that man was my husband and she slammed the door. Now, my father actually isn't black, he's dark skinned, but since coming to this country, in a way he was always navigating that otherness or kind of which world was he going to be in from when he started at Howard onward to being a math teacher and onward again. Needless to say, after that incident, my parents said, we are out of here and they moved us to a community called Parkway Village. And Parkway Village was a community that was uh, built for UN families. And it became a kind of magnet, a sort of idealistic magnet for multiracial families, biracial families. This is where families raised their kids because they felt this is where they could be safe, where we were kind of normal. We weren't weird in any way. And we were this community was sort of surrounded by the rest of Queens, which was highly, highly segregated. And it was, you know, very much polarized in a sense. So 
we fast forward many years and I am an early teenager. It's the 70s. I'm in seventh grade and I have a beau, Wendell, who's black. And uh, Wendell and I actually don't do much together because he lives in South Jamaica. I live in a different part of Queens. So we talk on the phone every night. I have this big rotary red phone and that's what I do. I, we talk and talk and talk. Um, the girls in his neighborhood bully me at school. Um, they say, stay with your own race, which for me was a rather confounding thing to say because I actually wasn't sure what my own race was. Um, they steal my clothes from my gym locker, which was a real horror. But, you know, we just keep on. We swap bracelets. And then one day we devise a plan to bicycle together and will bicycle in my neighborhood. So right before I'm about to leave, my parents pull me to the side and they tell me I can't go on the bike ride. My heart sinks. I can't go on the bike ride because Wendell's black. After my mother pulls me aside and says, look, your father can't handle it. Now, I rarely fought with my father, you know, he just wasn't the type to kind of be strict or come down on me for anything. In fact, the few times he tried to discipline me, he'd sort of whip out his leather belt, say, that's what, you know, we did when I was a kid. And then I'd wail profusely and he would wind up apologizing to me. But this was one case where I guess I felt I had to obey him. I was somewhat of an obedient daughter in a sense, though I did not understand it. So with dread in my stomach, I bicycled to the green where I was supposed to meet Wendell. I can still see him so eager on his banana seat bicycle. He's so happy to see me. And then I have to tell him, I can't go with you. I'll never forget his face, crestfallen. I'll never forget how he turned his bike away and said to me, it's because I'm black, isn't it? But was it? I felt that was the sort of thing that happened in the communities around us, because I am utterly perplexed by my father's response. It doesn't make any sense in terms of our history, in terms of who we live among, who we're comfortable with. What can't he handle? What ball of irrational emotions was were occurring at that moment? Weren't we the family who had to seek refuge in our community because of race? Wasn't this the father who'd spent most of his life more happily in a world of color than a white world? Who often confessed to me that he didn't trust white people. Who used to tell me in a hushed voice that there's a conspiracy against black people in this country. So in fact, the story didn't end there. Despite Wendell's crestfallen face, despite that terrible moment, we still kept on on the phone. And out of our phone conversations, it came to be that Wendell wanted to have one of the little kittens that my cat, he had a new litter and he wanted one of my kittens. So bizarrely, my father said, oh, great. I'll take you to Wendell's for the kitten. So I'll never forget that day. We stepped up to the house. The two fathers met. They looked like one another. They had the same booming voice. And the last I saw of Wendell on that day, the screen door was flapping shut. He was smiling and he was cradling the kitten. So what was going on? What was behind his utter unreasonableness and then his willingness to go to their home? I, I didn't get it. Since my father was a mathematician, I'd like to bring up another concept, that of the golden ratio. It's a Greek philosophy idea, also known as the golden mean, but I'm, I'm, I, I'm sorry, the golden ratio and the golden mean. Now I'm kind of rusty on all of this stuff, so I'm gonna give you my lay person's way of thinking about it. I think of it as a way of dividing up a rectangle that creates a kind of perfect proportionality. Now, I like to think of my father's response, however opaque, however utterly confounding, however messy, perhaps if I could parse out the parts. First, 
He was an immigrant, a man who'd come from a country where Indians and Blacks lived side by side, but they rarely intermarried. So one could say it's a pretty typical prejudice of an Indo-Guyanese. On the other hand, I can't give that part too much weight, too much proportionality, because those were precisely the attitudes that he ran from. He said this all the time. Try another part. Deep down, my father was a colonial, worshiping and hating the empire that had molded him. Even if a world of color was where he was most comfortable, he'd had it seared into him that white was simply better. One might call it a form of self alienation. He couldn't help it. And though he'd come to embrace this kind of groovy multiracial world of my generation, those reflexes were deep inside of him. There's another part an old fashioned Indian father. This was actually the first boy who was sort of romantic. The prospect of his 13 year old daughter dating any boy, much less a black boy was terrifying. Two years later, when I dared to stay out with an unknown boy in a car, he came running out with a crowbar. So the final and last part, poor Wendell, he came from South Jamaica. So it probably was also about being from the wrong side of the tracks. That year, my parents and I, just a few months after this whole incident, went to stay with friends at their summer home in Sag Harbor. My parents fell in love with the African-American community there. I had crushes on a number of the cute boys who promised to take me to the cemetery at night along with all the other kids, and they decided to try to buy a house there. The sale didn't work out, but to them, they loved being part of that. That was where they felt safe. And then I realized the way they sort of talked about it. They said, oh, those boys, those boys are, they're like us, middle class, aspirational, the same as an immigrant family. Any whiff of going backward to poverty, to being hemmed in by race, scared him to death. So there you have it a golden ratio that perhaps unpacks an utterly confounding response by my father. To this day, I'm ashamed that I gave in to his irrationality, that I obeyed, that I was the good daughter and sent Wendell back on his banana seat bicycle. This is one time I wished I'd gone against my own good daughter instincts and pressed him. But it brings me to that phrase, the other side of reason as a parent. As parents, as children of parents, we often do things that are unreasonable, irrational. We don't even know where they come from. We may bring out our compasses. We may parse and measure for understanding as well we should. But I think about this now at a moment when we're really convulsing with facing the racial dynamics of our country, the violence that undergirds it. It's so easy to be righteous. It's so easy to be sure that this is a reasonable way to move forward. And we are right. But the other thing I want us to remember is we should also be kind. We are not mathematical proofs. We are human. We are layered. We are full of history. We are contradictory. We do in so many ways defy reason. Thank you.